Welcome to the MSU Deer Labs online seminar series brought to you by Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. My name is Steve Damaris and I'm the Taylor Chair in Applied Big Game Research and Instruction at Mississippi State University. Thank you for joining me. Today I want to talk to you about nutritional ecology of white-tailed deer and also the life stage requirements what a deer is going through at different times of the year, which will help you understand when they need the nutrition that they need. Combining those two sources of information will help you improve your habitat management decisions, because I'm going to teach you about something called a phenological mismatch, a seasonal phenological mismatch, a mismatch between the plant characteristics which determine the nutritional quality of the plants for the deer and the deer's needs. The deer needs need to be met with adequate nutrition. And unless you understand that the habitat is not necessarily giving the deer what they need at the right time, you can then make habitat management decisions to fix that problem. All forage is not digestible. Forages, plants have a group of cells and each cell has uh, a wall and cell wall carbohydrates strengthen that wall and and they have these structural carbohydrates much like uh, two by fours that go up into a house this cell wall carbohydrates cellulose and in an extreme case it's called lignin lignin is actually wood cellulose is what wood is made up of and the cellulose within a, a non-woody plant, like the, the soybean uh, plants in this picture to the right, uh, those plants are growing upright out of the soil. And the only reason they can stand upright is because of the structural cell wall carbohydrate known as cellulose. The problem is vertebrate animals, animals with a backbone, vertebrate animals cannot digest cellulose or lignin. So all vertebrate animals that eat plants need to have bacteria to perform the function of digesting the cellulose. That's a really critical point. There's so many bacteria that are beneficial for us and so many that are bad for us, but uh, the bacteria that digest cellulose for uh, deer and other animals are really, really important. The ability to digest cellulose is dependent upon some morphological adaptations that animals have. These morphological adaptations really determine what an animal should eat. Bovids, cervids, and pronghorn use a, a morphological adaptation called a four-stomach fermentation approach to obtain nutrients from their forages. This four-stomach fermentation is a way for the animals to use bacteria to digest the cellulose and the cellulose being digested provides food for the host in two different ways. First off, there's a bit of a mini food chain. I'll refer you to the picture on the right. The esophagus would enter the rumen right where that arrow is pointing. The rumen, think of it as a two things. One is a storage container, and the other thing is a crock pot. So a deer, which is a prey animal, and a prey animal needs to go out and forage, avoid being eaten by a predator, and then go and hide and process their food. So they go out quickly, get the food, and then go and hide and, and, and digest it and process it. So this rumen is, first off, a storage container much like you would go if you're going to pick blueberries or pick apples or strawberries. You have to take a container, you pick them off the plants, and then you take them home and process them. So the deer goes out, finds its food, and swallows it quickly, as whole as possible, into the rumen, and then goes and hides. While it's hiding, it's processing that food, part of which is regurgitates the leaves back up its esophagus into its mouth, and it chews it. This is called chewing its cud. And so it didn't take the time to chew the food well when it was out in the open eating, but now it takes its time chewing it and, and uh, in a safe place. 
So this process of chewing it and processing it takes quite a while. And think of the second function of the rumen as a bit of a, like a crock pot. The crock pot has to work for hours processing the food that you cook in it. And so too does the rumen work for hours processing the forages that have been properly chewed up by the deer when it's chewing its cud. So within that rumen, there's a, basically a mini food chain. The bacteria are digesting the cellulose and then the bacteria are themselves eaten by protozoans. Protozoans live in the rumen also. And then the protozoans are then digested by the host, the deer, or in the case of an, uh, a cow, a cow is much larger than a, a white-tailed deer, of course, and a cow rumen is, is much larger than a deer's rumen. But the interesting thing about a cow rumen is it can have up to two kilograms of protozoans. That's almost five pounds of protozoans, which are microscopic single-celled organisms that are living in that rumen in the, in the fluid. And they're living by eating the bacteria that are eating the cellulose. And these protozoans pass out of the rumen and about 70% of them pass out of the rumen every day. And they total 100 grams of protein for the cow. That's a huge content of protein. And it's all because of the bacteria that start digesting the cellulose, the, the bacteria are eaten by protozoans, and then the protozoans are eaten by the host, whoever's rumen it is. The other source of food from the bacteria is called volatile fatty acids. These are byproducts of the bacteria living in the rumen, and these volatile fatty acids are absorbed by the papillae, and these uh, volatile fatty acids are uh, an important energy source. So a deer or a cow, a bovid, a cervid, a pronghorn, they get protein and energy because of what happens in their fore stomach during the fermentation process. As the animal processes these protozoans and then ultimately the, the chewed up leaves get small enough, uh, broken down enough that they pass also from the rumen into the reticulum and then into the omasum and into the abomasum. The abomasum is roughly equivalent to our human stomach. It's a single uh, stomach that has digestive enzymes and, and acidity, uh, much like our stomach processes our food. And so it spends some time in there further digesting. And then as it gets more and more digested, it leaves the abomasum, goes down and through the small intestine uh, quite a long ways through the small intestine, then gets uh, empties into an area called the cecum, which is uh, a blind sac. It doesn't go anywhere. Uh, you might have heard of a human appendix. Uh, appendix in humans is equivalent body part to a cecum in a deer. Only our human appendix is non-functional. We don't need to digest plant parts like deer do, so we don't have a functional uh, appendix and, and sometimes it gets uh, infected and it's removed and that does not affect your digestive processes at all because the appendix doesn't isn't involved in the digestion of your food. But the cecum is, there's more bacteria living there, uh, in essence an extra storage vat and crock pot. It leaves the cecum, it can then go in through the large intestines and ultimately out the rectum. Now I want to show you this figure, this diagram of two types of four stomach fermenters. The first is a water buffalo, and, and this refers to it as a bulk feeder. And a bulk feeder uh, is basically, think of a bovid, a bison from North America or a cow from North America is a, uh, a bulk feeder. And then in this example, it shows a roe deer. Well, a roe deer is essentially equivalent to a white-tailed deer, only it lives in Europe, and it is called a concentrate selector. So these two types of foraging animals have different types of morphological adaptations that determine what type of food they should eat. 
I want to focus on the characteristics of the deer, the concentrate selector. They have uh, a relatively short intestine. So they're, they're small and large intestines uh, together. The uh, concentrate selectors are usually 12 to 15 times as long as the body length. So if it's a four foot animal, uh, the intestines will be 48 to uh, 60 feet in length. Okay, so they have a relatively short intestine. Now you might not think 60 foot long intestine is short, but if you compare it to a bulk feeder, a bison or a cow, it can be 25 to 30 times their body length. So it is relatively short. The other characteristic is their rumen is relatively simple small. It processes things for a while, but it, it doesn't hold them as long as a bulk feeder will hold them uh, because uh, of the type of food that they digest. Concentrate selectors have a relatively large liver. A liver is part of the detoxification system within an animal. And if an animal, a deer in particular, eats something that is toxic in the plants, it can be detoxified within the liver. And so it has a relatively large liver because it tends to eat a lot of plant parts that are toxic. And we'll learn uh, more about some of those when we talk about secondary plant compounds such as tannins. And then lastly, I want to point out the large salivary glands. These large salivary glands secrete uh, a lot of saliva. And the reason the salivary glands are so large and that it needs so much saliva is Again, it eats plants that have secondary plant compounds that are toxic, and it needs to basically hinder the toxin before it gets into the body using its salivary glands. So these four characteristics of concentrate selectors, like the roe deer and the white-tailed deer, tell us a lot about what type of food they need to eat. They are concentrate selectors and so they have a more rapid passage rate that smaller rumen can't hold a lot very long so it passes through relatively quickly and so because it passes through uh, the rumen and the short intense intestines relatively quickly the deer needs to eat a more easily digested lower fiber forage and oftentimes those Forages contain secondary plant compounds, which have to be either in advance deactivated by the salivary glands or the toxins processed by the liver. And so some of these secondary plant compounds, if, if it wasn't for the liver and salivary glands of, of the deer, uh, it would actually kill the animal. And, and if you ever heard of acorn poisoning in a cow, it's because they've eaten too many acorns and so the, the tannins in the acorns can actually kill a cow, but a deer is going to love those acorns because they have the ability to deactivate some of those toxins and then process them more effectively. So this tells us what kind of food a deer should eat. And it basically comes down to higher quality forages. And this slide is titled, So What? So what if it has all this stuff? Well, the bottom line is the needs of a of an animal for forage are going to drive your habitat management decisions. If you don't understand what deer need, and in particular, higher quality forages that are relatively easily digested during the relatively short time that it's going to be within the whitetail, then you aren't able to make the right habitat decisions. That's the so what behind all this terminology.